going on not much to be honest with you you know i'm just kind of um you know I, I, of, I guess thing things are a lot more strict like in new york like to compared to we about the looks of it i mean it definitely feels that way i mean i don't know if they if they if they are but like um you know there's because it's such a dense city and stuff it's like you don't like I, I feel like a lot of people are really not wanting to leave their apartments because everyone lives in lives in small apartments too so um mm. oh yeah 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 it, it feels like i spent a long time in here now yeah you say you're with your girlfriend yeah I'm, I'm with me like me and jen just you know we, we live together out in queens so oh uh, yeah. yeah i mean that's good you know what i mean it's like I'm glad to, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that I'm at least with her, but it, it's, mm. yeah, it's kind of, like, it's just spent a long, a lot of time in this apartment at this point. Yeah, yeah no, you, you want to fucking move when it's all over. <laughs> and, uh, what, what about you guys? Like, is, so it's not that, it's not a strict feeling over there, I guess. Are you guys in London? Well, I uh, uh where, where are you are you're in manchester right yeah yeah uh yeah, yeah i'm in london but cities. like people yeah people just seem to like i don't know people just not, not really giving a fuck now i think like you know the first five weeks or whatever was kind of strict but it yeah. was just like every park i've been in now is like it's like a fucking festival <laughs> <laughs> well yeah because as soon as he says you can meet each other in parks. That was getting over, wasn't it? It's like everyone just went mad. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. everybody buy, buy like fucking Critter Stella. I'll see you there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Two meters apart. Mm. It's, it's, that sounds, I mean, that sounds amazing to me. You know what I mean? Just, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not like that here, suffice to say. Yeah, is everyone wearing masks over there and stuff? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you've got to, I see a lot of people like, I don't know why there's a trend in this city for like people wearing the mask but not over the nose, you know, not covering the nose. Like, <laughs> so stupid. It's just like it's Fuck it up. I, I actually saw this I saw a video on Instagram it was like this guy in a shop and uh, a customer walked in and she'd cut a hole in her mask. Yeah. I mean yeah. And he was like he was like, What what's your mask all about? And she was like, Oh yeah, it helps me from freezes like they're just wearing Mental. it for fashion at that point, you know. Yeah, I mean? It's just like fucking weird. It will become a trend now, though, right? Like people. Yeah, no, I, I mean, masks. It, well, I was thinking that thing with like, um, you know, because we're figuring out how to make it the, you know, like, you know, going forward and stuff like, you know, like when you make stuff like music videos and, mm. you know, you've seen a lot of bands kind of putting stuff out, like, and kind of using that as the, as the theme or the vibe to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Like an isolation thing. I'm like, God, that's gonna, you know, that's gonna get really old really quick. Ryan, I thought um, a good starting point. I was watching since we spoke to Gary. I started watching all your videos again, and I saw an interview where you talked about the origins of Chai Town and that you used to live in Chicago, which I knew nothing about uh, before uh, you was, before you were signed. Uh, yeah, tell us a bit about that. Well, yes, I, I yeah, I did for a little while. Um, uh, back in uh, was it like two thousand one or two thousand two? Um, I was like, you know, I was planning on moving out there. Um, and th then a lot of the, you know, that was kind of thing. I guess. The you know we we'd started the cribs back in two thousand and one, um, and you know we, we, it was just well I mean we'd actually been going for a long time. I know Gary talked about that. You know there was always like a period where like you know even since like the nineties you know we would um, just like play covers and stuff in my bedroom. Me Gary and Ross you know like Ramon's covers and stuff like that. So. Yeah, you know, we had been going for a while, but it started properly in around 2001, and we did 
didn't really, you know, we were really surprised, I, I suppose, by the fact that, you know, what, you know, the kind of music that we were playing, when once the strokes and the white stripes and all that stuff started happening, it almost became like, a, um, it became really like in vogue, you know what I mean? And like there was like labels that were like actively like hunting down, you know, more kind of garage rock bands. And so whilst I, I was, had kind of like two things going on, so yeah, there was that that I was out in Chicago and I'd be um, calling my brothers and they'd be telling me about like, um, you know, um, they'd be updating me on stuff like, you know, with labels, like how they were, uh, you know, like how close we were to signing the deal. And I kind of knew that the two things weren't going to go hand in hand. They weren't going to work out. You know, it's like if you signed the deal, I knew that I was going to have to be like, you know, there was, there was no way that I could like plan for a normal kind of conventional life. I was going to have to uh, move back to the UK and like obviously be on tour all the time, which is like what we did. You know, we were on tour in the early, like in the early years of the band, you know, we'd be on tour like, like 250 days a year or something. It was like proper full on. So, um, yeah, so I, I ended up yeah, coming back to the UK and we signed the deal in 2002. And then after that, yeah, we just didn't, we did, didn't stop basically. So that kind of made it so that, uh, yeah, living out there was never going to work out for me, unfortunately. And I think that that kind of, like, kind of really drove me a lot in the early days. Because I was like, well, I guess this is what I'm doing now. You know, the, like the band is, the, you know, I just had to put, like, like dedicate like my entire life to it. I mean, you know what it was like? It's like, you know, when you start a band, and especially in the early days, uh, I, like, you know, once, once you make that decision that that's what you're going to be, you're going to be a musician. It, it's like a full on lifelong commitment. You know what I mean? Where you like literally live and die by it. So it's, it's a dream as well, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, and, it um... is. Yeah. I mean, I think that in, like in the back of your mind, even if you start up a band and you don't, that's not necessarily what you want to, you know, you, you're not necessarily starting out because you want to get signed or whatever no um you always have in the back of your mind i'd be like yeah it'd be amazing to like play at red and then, and it'd be amazing to um you know to do this and to do that so then when you you know you, you get that opportunity or like you know you have like because for us it was weird because we actually had labels like kind of chasing us but, you know like i think like you know, we the the when we got signed originally, but I think it was only like our fourth show or something. We had to figure out a way of playing in London because we had so many labels interested, and um, so it was it was really quick. It was like really like like we went from yeah all working together in my dad's factory to just being um like signed and like out on the road and you know it, it was just it, it was so fast that there was almost no time to even think about stuff but what were you doing in chicago right like how did you end up going and stuff well we played one of our early shows we played with um like we played in uh sheffield with bobby Conn, who was like we were really, you know, we really loved Bobby Conn. It was like that, that's the kind of music we were into when we first started. You know, we really liked, you know, like we were really, really into like more left field kind of stuff. You know, we were um, always like um, infatuated with more kind of like, you know, like the more, the more underground labels, like specifically, like, I mean, I guess a lot of it was like US stuff, you know, like Kill Rock Stars and Thrill Jockey. Um, all those kind of labels. So Bobby Conn was playing in uh, Sheffield and we got offered to, to support him there. So we went and uh, uh, we went and did that show and he really liked us. You know, we got on really well with all those guys. Um, I, I like started dating one of the members, you know, one of the members of his kind of, um, you know, uh, like, you know, someone within his circle. And so I went out to Chicago in summer 2002 and just kind of just didn't want to go back, you know, because it was so, uh, it, 
it was it, like you know that was kind of like that was kind of the first place I'd ever traveled so I mean I'd been on holiday and stuff when I was a kid but th that was almost like the first time that I left Wakefield properly I went like, like out there and it was such a massive change that I just immediately kind of fell in love with it and just didn't really want to come home but then yeah we had the band stuff going on and we had like interest from all these labels like, in, like people like Rough Trade and stuff that we were really psyched about and um so yeah it just had to, you know just i just had to make the decision that uh you know that i was going to come back and yeah that that was kind of the end of that story yeah i guess and then i guess one thing we didn't really ask gary was why you end up signing with which is i like you say there's quite a few yeah labels interested and you were like actively pursuing rough trade and people like that so what made you decide on which is in the end well, yeah, so originally it's like we signed, yeah, we signed, like, I know Gary spoke, I was, like, originally it was all major labels that were trying to sign us. Um, and it had, it had come kind of like out of the blue because like the only way that they'd heard was, was I mean, the only CD that we'd ever sent out was we were trying to get a, a show at the lead mill. And so the guy that ran the lead mill had somehow circulated it. And then, I guess like people passing it around the industry and we were getting major labels calling us all the time so we, you know yeah that's that's cool and that was exciting but it's not really like what you know it wasn't really what we were, were necessarily into so we started um you yeah, know we started hitting up like labels that we were actually interested in and we called um at rough trade and called james endicott and he came to see us in London and then there was a lot of like there was kind of like a long period because we didn't have um we didn't have a, a like Ross wasn't 18 so we couldn't actually sign a deal and like we had our lawyer tell us like look you could sign now but then I would have to redraw the contract up here when Ross turns 18 and we're like, how much is that going to cost? And we're like, oh, about a grand. And we were like, no way, you know, because like, that was like mm. such an, a, a massive amount of money to us that there was just no way that we, we were going to do that. So we ended up like kind of taking a bit of time off, actually, even though the art, like most of that first album was written and um, like, uh well, yeah just continued working because we had to wait for ross to turn 18 and in that time i guess there was like yeah so we like james endicott had come to see us and then there was a few more other indies that had become interested so we went down to london to do a showcase specifically for you know the uh like you know the, the, the labels we were more interested in who were all kind of like talking about us at that point anyway and um it, that was at the metro in one of we played that show and i guess like because they all know each other it was kind of like um like after we you know after we did that show it was which time that kind of uh, came to us first and said yeah we definitely want to sign we want to do like three three albums and um you know some singles and stuff like that and then uh, I, I spoke to James Endicott and he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we were all chatting and we just thought which would be the best place for you. So I kind of guess all those labels kind of have like a, you know, because they're all friends, I guess they kind of have an understanding really that which Wichita were the most passionate about us and we really want to sign to those guys as well. So we just, yeah, once we had those guys interested, we, um, we kind of stopped talking to the majors really and just immediately signed with an indie, which is like, I don't know, we didn't have a manager or anything back then. We, got, we were doing everything ourselves. So it would have been a, good to have some direction back then because it would at least have been interesting to, uh, you know, to hear what the majors were saying and stuff. But we were kind of just ignoring them, you know. But, um, and the, yeah, the people at the Indies just always seemed like, you know, they just seemed more like our kind of people and we would chat to them you know they were like into the same stuff but it's funny because whenever i see james endicott these days like usually i'll bump into him in a lift in london at about 4 a.m or something and they'll always be like why didn't i sign you guys again he always thinks <laughs> for some reason that like you know 
he, he always asked me like why didn't you guys sign with us again and i was like james it was like i'm pretty sure that uh it was you know you that didn't sign us but i think that like yeah. he always thinks that we knocked him back or something but he didn't i mean we we yeah, we always thought that it'd be great to be on that label because they were doing such good business at the time. But it's kind of annoying because if we hadn't taken that time out, I, our first album should have been out in 2002. It was all like, you know, um, it, or maybe like 2003. It was pretty much all written at that point. And the first album was actually recorded before we signed to Wichita. It was just, we saved up and went to Torag and just recorded it. And so it was all, it was literally all ready to go, like quite a long time mm. before it came out. And I would have loved it to come out a bit earlier. I mean, 2004 is fine, but it was, you know, it was actually, yeah, it was actually ready for, for like quite a long time before hand. Yeah, and that's similar to you when it's on, like you signed a, uh, a deal before you got a manager kind of thing. Yeah, and and then we, um, yeah, we kind of just got put in touch with like a bunch of different managers and then we had to like interview, you know, like hang out with them or whatever and make a decision on that. And it, yeah. it was really weird, it was, it was really weird like doing that at like such a young age as well because we obviously it's kind of a gamble that as well like I guess no, it is weird, not so it? much exactly. not so much with the yeah like not so much with the label but with management like obviously a manager's gonna their their job is to like convince well you know like they they convince us that they were gonna do this and that and it, it's quite it's quite a big decision to make especially like. Yeah, when, or I must have been 18 or something like that. Yeah, and that's the thing, you just get, like, all of a sudden, like, you go from being just, like, someone who's just, like, an idealistic kid playing music to all of a sudden meeting, like, industry people who you don't know mm. if they have ulterior motives, you don't know how trustworthy they are, and, yeah, exactly, you are under yeah. pressure to, to, you know, to pick one, otherwise you just can't get going with stuff. And, you know, yeah, we chopped and changed managers, um, like after the second record and stuff because it just wasn't working out and it, and that was part of it it was like we had to um you know like we because we were managing ourselves we just had to you know we were told we just had to get a manager we just had to pick a manager and yeah we just interviewed a few and just kind of just went with whoever we you know thought seemed like the nicest or coolest guy at the time you know what i mean yeah yeah exactly yeah like, like, how do you even choose that? Because you know, at the end of the day, they could be absolutely bullshitting you as well. Well, the I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the the oldest talk shit anyway. You know what I mean? They know that that's kind of like you know, built into the job. So it's like, yeah, yeah. like it's like an estate. It's like an estate agent, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does have that kind of vibe. I mean, the, I I can't. I don't know. I, I kind of felt like like that that was like a a, a strange thing from going from managing yourself or not managing yourself because that's not what you're doing, but like to go from like uh, being in control of everything to just handing it over to someone that yeah you don't really know, and then they're taking a percentage of anything that any money that you might make. It mm. yeah it, it, it did kind of feel that it, it it was kind of an uncomfortable feeling really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like you know, we've had periods as well of managing ourselves in the, you know, um, like since we've actually you know, you know, being a big band, and that that's really really hard. So I wouldn't want yeah. to try doing that again. Yeah, I was gonna say like, would you just rather have somebody else in control of it rather than I mean, you? Just got, you just got you. Just have to do it. You know, what I mean, you have to do it. I mean, yeah. like, me and Gary, like, Gary in particular is still very involved in, like, like the nuts and bolts side of stuff, like, really keep, like, an eye on, like, um, like the, the, the business side of things, because over the years, we've been on kind of, like, when I've looked, I look at the list of labels that we've been on over the years, and we've kind of been on pretty much everything, you know, we've been on, like, majors, We've been on all the we've been on all the different majors, been on various indies, and it's like we so we really like in the last few years we really had to take um, 
like really start taking notice of like the business kind of stuff because we've been like yeah literally any cliched thing that you can think of like to fuck a band up we've kind of had that happen to us we've had experience with it all so at this point yeah, now really. yeah yeah i mean it's just part of the course though if you're going for a long time like we have been you know what i mean it's like i mean yeah what you know we're still going now and we're like you know the last few years it's like we've done our biggest shows and like had our highest chart placements and stuff which is which is amazing but along the way it's been um it's yeah, yeah like literally every like we, we just had so many you know like every pitfall we've kind of like had some kind of experience with it so at this point now you yeah, were really kind of suspicious of um handing over too much control to anybody like you know we always kind of keep uh, an eye on stuff because it like yeah in those early days like um like you know 2004 2005 and you're on the road like 200 and odd days a year and the whole thing's just mm. one massive party it's like there is and you and you're so young and so inexperienced there's there's mm. no way that you can possibly uh keep an eye on what's going on in as far as yeah the business side of that goes and you're not interested anyway and exactly think, yeah that, that was it and i think people in the industry you know they know that you know what i mean they're like so i don't know but you've got all i'm saying is, is i think you've kind of got to like um like it really really does help to just make sure that you do keep an eye on stuff because like i don't know like i think like, that the industry views bands as disposable like comparing the uh major to an indie like do they uh because you've like obviously been on both do you like is an indie like gives you a lot more control or well yeah it's got it on it well yeah i mean i suppose so it's like an indie just facilitates you where with uh, with a major you know that they it's like it's it's different with the major because you know that they have um you know you know that they're coming at it from a commercial place and it does feel more commercial and it feels like that's where their interests lay you know it's like even mm. down to stuff like with an indie it's like oh you know you can pick all these various different colored vinyls and stuff like that and then with a major you know they want everything to be as standard and as cheap and as efficient as possible or they used mm. to do back in the day I mean, you know it's probably different now but um like I, I I think that if you're an established band, I mean, I know you guys signed to Pop Tones first and then went to Mercury, but I mean, you you guys were on a major pretty quickly. But I think that if you're yeah. an established band, going to a major it, it, is, you know, it's kind of, it's I, I kind of feel like it's a, a good step to go from an indie to a major um, because once you're established, there's not that pressure on you to perform. You know, they, they kind of know that you're already well established and you're already like you you're already popular enough that yeah you know that they're not just like like looking at you and expecting and thinking unless this blows up massive straight away then you are not going to pick them up for their next record which are, you know we would meet a lot of bands that sign to majors which i can see why it'd be so tempting you know because like this like more money and you know it sounds exciting sounds for major but yeah i think that a lot of people were really stressed about you know selling enough records to do a second album you know what i mean and like mm. you know if one album campaign is only like like a couple of years or whatever then yeah you might only be signed to a major for a, you know like you know a couple of years or whatever but like yeah like you know we've been signed for, for absolutely ages now i mean to us like it's funny talking about like back in the 2000s because yeah you know that's kind of when we started properly but because we haven't stopped since then it almost just feels like a period you know what i mean like a period of the band and it just feels like we're still kind of doing it you know Mm. Are you, who are you signed to at the minute? Um, well, it's it, we're actually kind of. I mean, all that stuff at the minute is like a little bit like weird because we we have been signed to Sony, but I think that 
you know, the like we're actually in like a like a transitional period at the minute where we're trying to um, like kind of set up our own label and and then put that through a major label. You know, so we have kind of like uh, an right. well, you know, not not a major label, but put it through like a big distribution company. So then we kind of have control of everything. So yeah. I mean, it just kind of seems to make more sense to do it that way now that you know we were so well established and we've been going for such a long time. It just it kind of like uh, you know it just kind of seems to make more sense for us to have as much control of as things as as we can. <laughs> One thing Gary said, Ryan, was that he was quite suspicious back in the day and that he, like, kept people at arm's length kind of thing. Is that something you felt at the time? No, like, yeah, we, we all were. We all totally were. Like, we were always kind of... Um, I mean, we we were always suspicious of stuff because, yeah, because, we, like, we were all brothers and we'd all grown up in Wakefield and we'd never felt, like, part of anything before. Like, you know, it's not like there was a scene in Wakefield or anything, so... Uh, yeah, we were naturally really insular, and people in the, you know, like people within the industry, yeah, we were naturally suspicious of them. They were so different to us, you know. But the, like, to the point where, in some ways, I kind of feel like we were almost like we were really good at sabotaging ourselves, sabotaging our whole career because it's like you'd go out and you know you go out on tour and when you're in different countries and like you know, meeting the people from the labels and stuff who you'd never met before we were always like we would always treat the label as kind of uh yeah with like a lot of suspicion you know what i mean it's not like we immediately like let them in and embraced them and it was all like fun we just kind of uh we were always suspicious of stuff and i, I remember one time we were out, um on tour in germany um and we just put out it was like so it was on the second record we just put out hey scenesters and our manager at the time called us and he's like oh you're not you're not going to believe this but hey scenesters has gone into the charts at number 12 this was before um uh, this was just the midweek it actually went in in the 20s or something and uh, he was asking us to come, like, to come back from Germany and be in the UK, so that we could do Top of the Pops because they would, you know, we were on, like, you know, they'd, they'd inquired about us, and I, I, I could just hear Gary in, in the in the hotel room in Germany, just, just having a really like, it just sounded like a really bad vibe conversation. It sounded like something had gone wrong. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> and it, I got off the phone. I was like, "What was it?" And he was like, "Oh, it, yeah." It was, like the manager saying that we're, you know, the that hair scenes is really high in the chart and wants to do top of the pots. But the way that I'd heard him talk about it was like, yeah, it just sounded like like he was pissed off or something. <laughs> but I think it was because like, um, yeah, you, you know, you get asked to like, you know, like to us at the time, like, you, you know, we t we didn't do it. We like for us, tarring was so important. We just was like, no, we're not going to do it. We just stared out on that tar and like didn't come back and subsequently didn't do top of the pops and we turned it down again on uh when men's needs came out which is a real bummer because it's like i look back now and i think that yeah we were, we were so idealistic it was like it was almost like we yeah did sabotage ourselves it's not like anyone knows that we turned down top of the pops it's not like you get like some, some kind of like medal of credibility for doing that and i would have loved to have done it now you know <laughs> it was so idealistic back then and so like you know, we were really fatalistic in our approach to everything that we would just do stuff like that yeah i was watching the leave too neat video from around that time and uh yeah. you were saying about you know having the ethos of not turning your back on the toilet tour kind of thing did that kind of add to the uniqueness of that period do you think that people were just leaving those venues behind once they got big i mean you guys certainly didn't um, and you made an effort to like play the smaller venues still. Yeah, I mean, we were still getting a buzz out of doing that because, um, you know, we'd spent the the like the first few years of the band just constantly on tour in those venues, and we'd had a really we really enjoyed it. You know, we really loved the fact that, um, you know, it was you were so close to the crowd, everything was just so in your face, and. Um, 
you know, like after the show, but yeah, there was just very little separation between the band and the crowd. So you get to know everyone and you'd meet people and you'd go to people, you go to parties and stuff or people's houses afterwards. So you get to like find stuff out about the city you were in, you know, like we, like, cause we were like a lot of our early touring, we weren't just playing big cities. We were playing a lot of uh, like smaller towns as well, which was, which, you know, in a lot of ways I always found was more fun. So it was like, yeah, we were doing like those small venues and then, yeah, you'd come off stage and you'd meet people and hang out and you'd go back to like a party at someone's house. And so we really loved that that kind of way of time and that lifestyle. And yeah, I did find that once we took the step up into bigger venues, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely more of a division between the band and the audience, you know? I mean, that's like, that's obvious, I mean, and there's there's a there's a good reason for that, I suppose. But um, like we just missed, we just kind of missed the, that you know the vibe of those early tours where you just be in a van, and uh, yeah, it, you know the, the the communal feeling of it. I mean, uh, that's kind of like it seems to be the operative word that a lot of people will mention in these interviews. That there was just such a communal feeling at the time because it was interesting for us coming from Wakefield and you know as i was saying it was there was no there was no real scene that we were playing on in wakefield there weren't really many venues to play there was a couple and um you know it, it was interesting for us after we did start going on tour and meeting people just how it was it was interesting just realizing that there were so many other people out there and like other bands that had the same kind of mindset you know it was it was really exciting and so um yeah we really enjoyed like all those early tours and like all like you know the adventure of it all and the um like you know it all felt so new back then and like yeah meeting new bands and new people so yeah when, once we got to the third album and by that point by that point like like you know the second wave i always think of it as it kind of started where um you know guitar music was so massive in the uk that it was being played on like radio one and stuff and by that point you had a lot of like you know a lot of bands that i feel like had maybe started purely for the reason to, uh, be, you know, because guitar music was popular, and it it got really watered down at that point, I think. And that, if, like, and so once, um, yeah, once Men's Needs came out, and that was getting a lot of play on the radio, we just kind of wanted to go back to, you know, go back to doing stuff how we used to do. But I, I mean, I, I would could I, I would find it so difficult to do that stuff now. I mean. We still do do a lot of, um, you know, we still do get asked a lot to, uh, you know, just go play small venues because people know that we had that, that uh, you know, that, like that ethos back in the day. But, I mean, we've done it so many times now that it's it's not, you know, it's, it's not imaginative for us to just go out and do small venues again. You know, it's like we've done it too many times. Yeah, I mean, you had a lot of different ideas back in the day which were really cool like when you played the three nights of the three different albums and uh, did you always yeah. like tick like always enjoy that kind of thing that made it a bit different well i guess we would have, you know yeah you'd always try and think of stuff that would like challenge you because like, i guess over those three nights we would you know we're trying to play literally every song that we'd ever written so it like you know that just kind of seemed like a you know an interesting kind of like challenge to do I suppose and yeah you know uh, it, it doesn't matter what's happening with whatever album you tour in you kind of get sick of playing the songs off that record so you know we would like miss playing some songs from the first record for example so like yeah doing a gig where you only play that album you know that that was you know that was cool for us you know that it was just I don't know it was just something it, it we just thought it was a good idea to, I, we knew that the fans would appreciate it. We knew that that was something they wanted us to do. So we were all quite led by our fan base in a lot of ways. You know, we would all, you know, we'd stay very connected with them. And, you know, like like through the internet and stuff in, in the early days, through the message boards and stuff, we would take notice of what people 
you know wanted us you know would like to see us do and then we'd, we would do that we were always like yeah just really trying to do stuff that the, we knew that the fans would appreciate yeah yeah and Tom I know I asked you this last week but those early touring days you must have <laughs> you know, have any more memories cropped up with gigs from the cribs and stuff um don't know right I mean, Tom, you, you you don't just know it, it, the same as what like what I do. That it's just it's it's all. I mean, the whole thing is just like one massive blur. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, the yeah, whole, exactly. The, it, was, it was it was. I mean, you look you look at it now, and you know, especially in these times of like lockdown and stuff, and you think, man, you know, that it was just so pure, and it was so like fresh, and everyone was just so excited, like. There was nothing, you know, like cynical about the thing at all, and it was just—it was just so much fun. I, I, I absolutely loved those early days, and it, it, yeah, yeah it, it's just all about. It's hard to kind of remember specific things because it was like yeah, the, the, there were so many, there's so many nights that blended into one as well, and like even just like the whole time was just like kind of a big. A big party, wasn't it? it? Was like it was, yeah. And uh, there's and absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think that, like, sometimes, like, you know, people want to, uh, you know, I, I feel like that's how you can tell it was a good time in music is because there was quite a, you know, there was a, a generation gap back in the early two thousands where um, it was the, the ki- like it was just the kids had just taken over, you know, and like yeah. the. Um, you know, the internet had facilitated that happening so it was like facilitating people's lives rather than dominating people's lives it was like like this golden period where the internet was was new enough that it wasn't yeah just completely dominating everyone's lives but it was helping people connect and get together and um like yeah people were taking the mega bus and it just made this massive community of people that um it it, yeah, it just became like, yeah, the, it, it was almost like the kids just completely took over, and um, yeah, there was, yeah, there was this generation gap, and like you know, all like you know, us guys, you know, we were just part of that that movement, you know, and, and it was and it was amazing because it was just it was so fun, like it felt completely unadulterated, and yeah, it, it like you were saying, it was just like one long massive party and i'm not ashamed of that at all i i, I, no, I, love it. I did best of my life i don't i don't regret any of that kind of shit it was just it, it was yeah it was just a lot of fun like even even like our shows like especially yours like a, a lot of the gigs that we used to get, remember there was always like stage invasions as well like, yeah was, always yeah. there's all oh, like the crowd would end up on stage like sing it taking over your all oh, mics days. and stuff like, yeah, yeah. I remember playing in um, Huddersfield with you guys. You remember that? It was I like don't... really early on. Did did we? That's crazy. yeah. We played like yeah, so, and and one like it was a fan who put the gig on. Yeah, and, uh, I mean that makes sense uh, because like a lot of the yeah. time, yeah, we like it was. You know, you'd hear pe- people get in touch with you through your message board and be like, they'd want to book you for a gig, and they would, you know, they would claim they were a promoter, and you would meet them, and it'd be like a really young kid, you know I mean? He wasn't a promoter, he was just someone who just wanted to book you and put a show on at his local yeah, it, 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 club, yeah, which wanted... was amazing that people had that, that, people just had that drive to do that stuff, you know? Yeah. There's, a, there's actually a picture, I think it's from that that gig, and and the, it's like a stage invasion, but I'm like stood next to you. Yeah. And I've got a, I've got a mic and, and you've got a mic, and it's just like, it just looks like a complete mess, to be fair. But yeah, it's like, what's going on? Yeah, you'd look at a lot of photos have... from those gigs and you'd be like, what is going on at that gig? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And it, you'd be like, is, like is, is that the crew's playing? Well, I don't know, because Tom's got a mic. And you're like, yeah, but it looks <laughs> like it's crew's playing. Who are all these other people on stage? You know what I mean? It was like, yeah. but that's what was so kind of like, you know, that, that was what was so enjoyable about it all. That there was, you know, it felt like, people were just doing what they felt like there was no um you know like it's like there, was, there really wasn't any it felt like there was just really no rules to stuff especially when you'd done mm. stuff like book your own shows you know which is like yeah. you know we would we, we well, obviously we had like a lot of structured touring going on and we we're doing lots of part tours and you know like 
taught, like you know touring internationally a lot in those early days and then yeah we would always do these shows that people just got in touch with us about about just like yeah just bookings for a random gig and those i always found those to be the most fun in the early days yeah, um, uh, yeah. one of the most fun ones tom I mean, i'm sure you were there do you do you remember the the hern hill gig oh uh, yeah that, who, who that, was one, that was really who, fun uh, well we played the uh, i'm pretty sure play you well. played what did they, the Unstrung, did they play that? Yeah, one? the Unstrung played. I think I think it was something to do with like yeah, they we... were releasing a single at the time or something. And like yeah. we just happened to be in London. So we were like, oh yeah, we'll come down and play as well. So there's loads of people playing at it. I mean, there's loads of bands on. But what I remember that was so fun about that show was that the um the the venue lost control of the of the uh, you know the the owners the the owners and the staff completely lost control of the venue and started freaking out and saying <laughs> that they were going to call the cops because they just couldn't you know they, they were just they were just overrun by like kids and there was like like stage diving going on everywhere and like yeah there's um, people so flying through the air they were proper freaking out and they were saying that they were going to call the cops and all I think they did call the cops and try and get it like you know everyone kicked out and stuff but. That that was I always look back on that as one of my favourite shows of that period because yeah it just was so um, like it was really last minute it was just like yeah we're just in London yeah we'll come round and do it and it was like yeah it, it was like an amazing gig you know remember that there was that song like where the fuck is Mo <laughs> yeah I remember that yeah Dom like that, that, it, did Dom write that song was it was it like was it like a crack deal or something. <laughs> Yeah, it, Mo was the dealer, wasn't he? Mo was the crack yeah. dealer. I think it was one of Dom's songs was that. I, I can't remember. I just remember, like, um, yeah, I was down in London staying at one of their houses or something, and that's the first time I heard it. And I'd met Bridger and all that on that day as well. But, um, yeah, that was right, yeah. It was just, like, a song that, like, was... <laughs> I had forgotten about that song until he just <laughs> it's mentioned it. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone ever record it or anything? I, I don't think so. I think it just. I guess like no one wanted like to kind of random. admit whose it was. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like yeah. Chinese rock, like by the Ramones, and the can't figure out if it was by the Ramones or the Heartbreakers or Richard yeah. Howe or something. It's yeah, probably right. the same with where the fuck is Mo. But I know that I definitely, <laughs> definitely not anything to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember just like they used to randomly get like sung at. Everyone, yeah, anyone, somehow, came, didn't yeah. yeah, it was like it was like anyone who was part of that scene, that song, like it was kind of like a chant, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was like because, um, it was the, like the whole message bar did at one, it was like, um, mm. I think that everyone was so connected on that, um, like you know, like all the fans were that it kind of you know, they, they kind of had their own, um. You know, they kind of, had, you know, the fans kind of created their own things like that, you know what I mean, that they would bring to the shows, like, you know, because they come to the show and they'd sing stuff like that, you know. Which I guess mm. it's some kind of, like, unifying kind of thing, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was just a joke, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. And, it, like, yeah, stuff was, like, fun back then, you know. That was kind of, you know, I think that, that's kind of part of the charm of it when I look back, that... Yeah. It, it was just everything was just so like out of control and random and you know I wish I could remember more of it, I really do, because uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some like I'm sure there's some amazing memories mixed up in that. But um mm. I mean I know for sure that it like it, it, yeah, it just seems so different to like you know, it seems like the absolute opposite to social distancing you know what i mean it seems like the absolute opposite to that yeah massive like like fitting 20 people on someone on dominic master's floor or in someone's flat. yeah exactly getting as many people together in as small a place as possible and yeah. people certainly weren't sh scared about sharing germs and stuff you know what i mean i'm pretty sure yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> I wanted Sorry. to briefly talk about um, exclamation pony as well. Like how, yeah, and and you end up you end up going going back to labels as well. Like so, you you ended up um, 
So did you did you sign to did you do a deal with like Colt with Julian? Yeah, with Julian. Was it like with Julian personally? Like, how did that come about? It was, yeah, it was with Julian personally. So, what happened was, so I came out to New York after I met Jen, and she was living in the studio. And um, at the time, so I came out to New York and we were staying in this studio, and it was kind of like it was almost like kind of part of our our like courting ritual, I suppose, is that we just started writing songs together because we were both musicians and because we were in this mm. uh, studio we just recorded it all and you know i think we like you know we, we wrote a, a full record in about like two weeks like and recorded it and a lot of it was just really great i was so excited about it i mean it was exciting for me to write with someone that wasn't my brothers because that's all i've ever done and i love that like, you know, yeah. writing with my brothers is amazing, but, like, finding someone else that I could actually write with was mm. was amazing. So we'd written this record, and when I first moved to New York, like, um, you know, some of the, one of the, I, I knew loads of people out here, and one of the people I knew was Hama. So you obviously you'd see Hama oh, yeah. all the time. And uh, I think that he was in, uh, at the, in the... Uh, he was just moving on to cult records at the time because um, I don't know who he'd been signed to before, but uh, he was he was just about to sign with cult, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, that's cool. And so I was telling him about my new band, and then um, I got a text to my phone, and it, it was from Hammer, and he just said, oh, Julian wants to hear your new band, so and he sent me his email address, so I sent him some tracks. Um, Because, you know, we knew the Strokes guys a little bit from doing some shows together. So I sent him some uh, some tracks and, like, one the one that he put out, I sent him a demo of it. Oh, not a demo, it just, you know, those guys just remixed it and he just just loved it. He was, like, like, obsessed with the song. He just would, like, call me about it and text me about it all the time. And so he wanted to put it out as a a one-off single. So we did, uh, you know, that... That was some, you know, we signed a deal just for a single with Cole, and so we did that. But like, I mean, it was it was slow. It was kind of like slow working with Cole because we're so used to like with the cribs, like you know, doing everything as quickly as possible. You know, like recording the record and trying to get it out quickly, and you know, we don't like to spend too long in the studio and stuff like that. But with Julian, when we did like that single with him. I can't, we mixed it so many times because he's such a perfectionist. You know, he wants everything to be like. You know, I guess he's got a real vision for stuff that he really wants to like. Um, you know, he really wants it to just be perfect. So yeah, we spent ages on that track, like you know, um, remixing it. And sometimes he would like. Uh, you know, we would get we would to the point where we we're really happy with it, and then he would want to change things around again so it took quite a while for us to get this the track finished and then we did a video which like you know we did this video with warren Fu, and it was amazing it was like a like proper 80s style video which was really fun and um mm. then and that took quite a long time too so by the time the single came out I was really wanting to put the album out because I knew that we were going to get busy with the Cribs again soon and Julian was going to get busy with the Voids as well because he was working on the Voids record at the time. Um, mm. So we, uh, I really wanted to do the get the album ready like, and just get it out. And, but that's just not the way that it worked. You know? it's like I ended up going back to do, doing Cribs stuff. He, Julian got busy with the Voids and we did that single. And yes, yeah, since then, there just wasn't any time for us to, you know, there was never a good time for us to put the album out, which is really frustrating because it's quite a long time ago now. Right? But it's like, if I put the album out, I would like, you know, I, I, it's not like I can just put it put it out because I want to be able to leave space for tar in it and stuff, you know. And yeah. I'm, all, like, I'm on tar with the crib so often that um, finding a good time to do it was being difficult, but um it i would have liked to have done the album with cult i would think that would have been great if we'd have uh you know just immediately done the single and then finished the album because i loved being on the label like 
like the, the, you know, I, I thought they were a really interesting label with a really specific agenda, you know. So uh, yeah, it was cool. fun to be a part of that. But um, yeah, we just it, everything took quite. As I was saying, everything so like it's a case of getting everything so perfect that there was never time to do the record, really. So, right. um, I, I, but I definitely wanted to come out at some point because I just love it so much. I, I'm thinking that now that we're, you know, kind of maybe setting up our own way, but like, you know, maybe that'll be a good time to do it. Right, yeah. Well, so you set up a label as the Crips? Well, no, we we always had kind of our, uh, I mentioned it at the beginning, like we, we like for the last couple of records, when we signed to Sony, um, we set up our own label and, and um, you know, so that we had more control over stuff. Um, and so it was, it became like an imprint, we had our own label, it was an imprint of Sony. And then now, like, yeah, we still, we still have that imprint and um, we, yeah, we just use that so that, we, yeah, we can sign to a big label and still have, you know, run things as the cribs because you know when like even for major levels it's like we've been going such a long time that they know like who we are and what we are you know and they know what our identity is and what our fan base is so it's like they you know they can trust us in that way to just be like oh yeah you know you guys just set up your own imprint and just do things your way so that's just it just makes more sense to us to do it that way yeah. So we keep more control over stuff, you know. Um, just looking back at that Leave to Neat time, um, there's obviously that Scotland gig where the whole crowd had to sit down. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that one of the maddest Australian gigs or was that like par for the course back in the day? We, no, it, it, yeah. It felt par for the course. I mean, maybe not at men's. You know, that was so that was when we were out promoting the men's needs record. Yeah. So, I mean, at that point, we'd just come off like a like a, a, a really long, massive arena tour in the states, and we you know we'd done <clears throat> we'd done a lot of our own big shows in the UK. So that was kind of why we wanted to do that tour in small venues, just to you know for a change for a change from doing all these massive places so we that's why we set that tar up but yeah i mean that gig in scotland that felt like the kind of thing that um back in 2004 and 2005 that would feel part of the course for things to be that dangerous and for that to be that out of control but at that point um it i mean it was freaky because it was like what, what, you know, the, what the show happened? was well, the show was supposed to be at, um, we, you know, we were supposed to be doing small venues. So we booked a show for um, at King Tut's in Glasgow. And while the support bands were on stage, uh, the venue flooded. So th they cancelled the gig and called it off. And obviously that meant that we were really disappointed and a lot of other people were disappointed. So I don't know who it was. Like someone found out, you know, by ringing around that there was like a really small, pub around the corner that we're gonna let us do a gig there but it was in their basement and when we went in there and took all the gear in there it was a really really tiny basement and there was no like fire exits or anything and then they've got like you know king tuts can fit like 350 people or something so everyone from the gig just like crowds into this uh um like tiny cellar and like basically we're just crushed against the back wall trying to do a show and yeah as soon as we started playing it was complete and utter chaos as you can imagine and it, we, it did feel genuinely like dangerous and scary and someone got like yeah someone got hurt you know which freaks us out a bit well no, it freaks us out massively because it's like yeah we were really you know we were young and we were reckless and like you know lived and died by the band and stuff but it's certainly hit, like still don't think it's worth someone getting seriously hurt at a show you know what i mean it's like yeah. i know that you know back then you know, people kind of like liked things to be as um you know people really loved that like that, that idea of things being as out of control and 
like putting on gigs in crazy places and stuff. But like, yeah, when you know, when we were faced with that reality that someone might have got really badly hurt, it just really freaks us out. So yeah, Alex from Franz Ferdinand got everyone to sit down and we just did a gig and everyone was seated. It was weird because like you'd see people trying to get up to like mosh and then some hands <laughs> would just go up and drag them back down. And stuff, you know? <laughs> You know, and that's in Glasgow as well. You know what I mean. So to get a Glasgow audience to sit down, yeah, that's, that's quite really... they're, they're, they're quite intense, are not? Yeah, yeah. Is that that's one of those things that every band says is like Scotland's have the best gig? Is that what you two felt? I mean, uh, like I, I can say from my experience that like yeah, there's there's no gig in the world like playing Glasgow Barrowlands and or, like you know Glaswegian audiences are just. Um, it's one of those things. It's like if you're if you're good and they like it, you're gonna have an amazing show. But if yeah. if you like get on stage and you suck, then you're gonna have like an, an absolutely torrid time, you know. <laughs> so that's the kind of crowd that they are. But um, I, yeah, and I love that about it. I mean, I'm sure you've got some like I'm sure you had some amazing shows in Glasgow. Tom. Yeah, we did. We had a really good. We had a really good relationship with a lot of Scottish people, you know, like a lot, a lot of like a lot of our mates back then. When you think about it, there was there was loads of Scottish people that there were there were loyal. Scottish people are very loyal as well. I think, like yeah, you know, especially, the especially to their, really yeah, especially to their own their own people as well. You know, if there's a Scottish band, they're always gonna like. I just feel like. They get right behind them. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they yeah, just like a local pride in like the yeah. You know, like people. we we record we recorded our second album and it's got in Glasgow as well. Yeah, so yeah, with Tony we, Duvin, right? yeah, yeah. I bet that yeah. was fun. Yeah, it was good, and we, we, you know we lived there for like three months. So that was another thing we had. We, we made a lot of met. You know, we had a lot of people. We used to throw parties like in the in the flat that we were staying in at the time. Yeah, it's like you know. We did have a really good relationship with Scottish people, yeah, definitely. It's good. Mental gigs. Like it, Tea in the Park as well, I remember when we played Tea yeah. in the Park a couple of times, that was always like Yeah. It's like probably the maddest festival. It was, yeah. I mean it, it it's not going anymore, is it? Which is like Is it think, is it not? I think it got like I think it got cancelled, did Tea in the Park. But yeah, I would I, I always really like that. I mean um yeah. Like, like I remember once in the in the, the early, I think maybe on the first record, like yeah, we headlined the new band's tent, and it was completely insane. It was it was a small tent, and like um, I, I can't exactly remember. I, I, it's one of those things where everything blurs into one. I can't remember exactly what happened, but something like you know something happened at that gig. I can't remember what it was. I mean, that's the thing. I'm looking back now to try and remember specifics from like specific shows because I know that they like make like the most interesting stories. But I remember like we played in. There was a time when we played in. It wasn't Glasgow. It was Edinburgh. We played at the Liquid Rooms in Edinburgh, and oh, yeah. there were so many people place. getting on stage all the time that the stage collapsed while we were playing. Like the stage like literally collapsed. Shit. And I think there was, like, you know, there was people under there because when people would crowd surf, they would uh, pull them over the barrier and stick them under the stage and they would go out round the back. There's people in there. Yeah, the whole stage collapsed, which was just like, it's such a shock when it happens while you're playing, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. one minute you're doing a gig and the next minute you're just completely wiped out and, you know, there's gear everywhere and you just don't know what's happening. And so that happened in, in Edinburgh. So that was like a memorable show. Uh, that was in the New Fellas time. And just before we did that tour, we were out, we were over here in New York doing one of our first New York shows. And somebody, I don't know what happened, but again, the gig got cancelled because someone got shot in the venue. And so I remember oh. like getting the, the NME that week. I mean, to remember the NME was just like, it was like everywhere at the time. It was just like reporting on every single, you know, on every single move that you made, you know, which was, uh, yeah, I thought right. it was really fun. But yeah, they got the enemy that week and there was like two stories in there about us. And one was like stage collapses at Cribs gig in Edinburgh. And then the next new story was someone shot at Cribs gig in New York. And I was like, Jeez. man, that just yeah. sounds insane. And you can see now where, you know, I was like, 
you know, when you start a band, you think, oh, you know, you read bands' biographies and you think, oh, that's all obviously blown out of proportion and it what didn't happen like that. And, you know, you know, it can't have been that crazy. They must just be, like, making it up. But you can see where all these stories come from because if you put people on the road for long enough um, or, like, you know, at the right time uh, and you just put people, like, together constantly going on the, on the road and, like, going to different places, yeah, you're going to, like all sorts of things happen and you know yeah, it's like it's gonna be so well yeah obviously the way that the press reported those um incidents from our show was a bit blown out of proportion but that's how people remember it now you know another story that made headlines around was obviously you at the um 2006 enemy it was i mean you must get asked about that quite a lot but just need to yeah, touch yeah. on what you remember from that yeah no i used to get asked by that all the time that was almost like the uh like, the, like, it was almost like one of my most defining moments. But <laughs> and the other third person that's actually asked me about it in age is, uh, okay. um, but that was like, we were, yeah, so we, I, I, I was never really into going to those award ceremonies, you know, and it, like, you would go to, like, you know, uh, you know, we'd get invited and you would go to be, you know, because like, the, all these magazines would support you and some, you know, to be polite and yeah, there, there would be a fun time sometimes but, you know, I'd always feel kind of embarrassed at, the, at those award ceremonies, seeing people like you know, everyone walking about kind of like being too cool for school and stuff so um, I felt kind of like I was sitting there feeling kind of awkward and um, you know, obviously we were just we've been drinking a lot because that is what happens at those award ceremonies and um i can't fully remember how it happened i remember that uh i think i think it was pete it was something like peter hook or someone was presenting an award to franz ferdinand and they weren't there so he said oh well kaiser chiefs can have it and they were we were sitting on the table with kaiser chiefs because we had the same management and they said, oh, the Cribs can have it. So they gave it to me. And because all of a sudden the spotlight was on me and it was on TV, I just I just didn't, you know, and yeah, I was wrecked. I just didn't know what to do. So I I, I don't even know what I tried to do. But somehow I ended up <laughs> like, like a swan wiping out on that table. I don't really know what the plan was in my head. It was just like a, a knee-jerk response to just do something. And yeah, I ended up like... Uh, everyone knows the story falling on like uh, a big vase and it like smashed and it just it turned into like a big spear and stabbed me straight through the back like um like completely ripped my back open i didn't realize went on stage took the award and when i went when i left the you know went came off and went backstage everyone that i encountered was just like drip white and like really freaked out looking like we've got to get you out of here and i'm like why, what's going on? And like, you've got to get out of here. And I put my hand on my back. My fingers just went, I felt my fingers just slip straight inside the oh. wound. It was so gross. And oh, um, went to hospital and like, like the, the stitched me up at the hospital. And the, the doctor said, now, you know, you've got to go straight back to your hotel and go to bed. He was like, you can't keep going out tonight. You've got to go back and go to sleep so you've lost a lot of blood and um you know that would be the best thing for you to do but i went back to the enemy awards and it's a good job that i did because if i'd have followed that doctor's advice advice he hadn't i hadn't been stitched up properly so i went back to the enemy awards and i was like they hadn't the, basically the wounded like yeah it sliced the you know the ex you know the my skin and flesh and gone through and then it had also torn through like the membrane around my kidney or something so they hadn't stitched that up so they basically just stitched the outside up so i was just bleeding internally and it you know it was just filling up with blood and i was leaving blood everywhere around the enemy awards and so um i i can't fully remember what happened but I, like i think maybe I think maybe the story is that someone found me passed out somewhere. So that I'm assuming that that's what happened. But um, I got taken back to the hospital and um, they either had to like, like undo the stitches and then stitch me up internally 
and then I was I was okay after that but it was it was really bad you know it kind of it kind of freaked me out a little bit afterwards like like once I after the you know after we got home and after all that was done like, like it kind of freaked me out how like how dangerous it had been you know what I mean because like yeah it was like uh, reported and everyone thought it was a cool story and it was really funny and stuff but it was actually like you know it was actually super dangerous you know yeah yeah, yeah. but it's still a funny story <laughs> <laughs> Gary, like, touched on relationships you've had with different musicians and working with different musicians like Alex Kapranos and Lee Ronaldo. But I just wondered how those relationships came about in the first place. It's generally down to, the, to you know, I think that, like, it's essentially a pretty small world backstage. It's like once you... Um, you know, once you get into like the touring scene and circuit and festivals and stuff, like you know, you end up basically most bands will end up crossing paths at one point or another. And you know, the the people you just you know you like once you meet bands or musicians that are like minded or you know are into the same stuff, it's really easy to get along with them because they're in the same position you are and it's an and it's an unusual position you know the life of like a time musician is really unusual so yeah we'll meet we would meet someone like alex um like uh um i think we the first time we played with them we were supporting them somewhere and so we met alex and yeah got on really well because it turned out uh, we knew a lot of the same people from the from the indie pop scene, like when when he used to be in the Yummy Fur. So it turns out we knew a lot of the same people, and um, yeah, we just got just got on really well, really quickly because yeah, for you know, you meet another time musician, you've you've got so much in common already anyway because of your lifestyles. But if you meet people from with similar backgrounds, it's it, yeah, it, it's like. It, it, you you have a, it's almost like it it makes it easier to have a really the rapport is so easy but like and you have like a, an intense relationship with them really quickly because um you know it, everything's so transient on the road you know it's like you're in one town one day and then somewhere else the next day that um it's kind of like uh yeah you just you just meet so many people and like like yeah the people that you have stuff in common with but you know you remember them and it sticks with you and you like you know you make an effort after that to hang out again so that's how we met alex and then we went on tour with them in the states uh, for a couple of months and so at that point we saw him all the time so we became really good friends after that and so when he wanted to produce our uh third record and we had like a, a few other big producers at the time who were wanting to do it and we were having meetings with them I, I remember alex came down to wakefield and spent the night there and hung out with us and he had all these great ideas for it and he just seemed like you know it just seemed like that would be the most fun thing to do so that's why we went with him and a similar thing with lee ronaldo because he like we'd actually approached him in the first place about um uh, producing our producing men's needs but we hadn't ever met him before but then uh, we were out at Coachella and uh, Sonic Youth were playing as well so because we'd asked we we met him at Coachella um, because our manager in the States he knows the Sonic Youth guys really well because he used to our manager used to work for Nirvana so he like like introduced us all and yeah we just like Lee's just a great guy we just got on really well with again we know a lot of the same people and uh like once you work together in the studio and things go well you know it's like like we worked with Lee for maybe only an afternoon and it just went so well but after you've done that and you've created the song together yeah you have like a you know you have some kind of special bond at that point I think well, if you've made a song together, you know what I mean? It's quite a significant thing. Yeah. I mean, Tom, was that a similar thing with you guys and Adam Green? Was that quite an organic thing? Yeah, exactly. Like, again, like, 
We just we met Adam. Uh, you 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 guys have met with Adam Adam as oh, well. Oh yeah, yeah. But, but that's it, it, I love that Molly Peaches record when it came out. Yeah. Like, oh man, I was like, obsessed that with that. Molly Peaches album, I loved it so much. I, I heard it at one of my friend's house, and yeah. um, uh, I, that was the first album I ever tried downloading off uh, Napster or whatever. And because I, yeah. I just had no money at the time, and I was, I only wanted to, the main track I wanted to download was Lucky Charms. I remember clicking right. on it to try and download it, and it said something like 48 hours remaining. That's how <laughs> long to have used it back then. And I, and I yeah, went yeah. It for all that time and actually downloaded it. You know, it's, I got yeah, it I love like that. two days later. <laughs> really good album, that. I was, yeah. Yeah, I was watching the uh, Kimmy Dawson started posting. And stuff actually online today with her and her daughter. Her daughter's like similar yeah. now. I was just gonna say about um with uh with, yeah with Adam like we we met Adam I think through like Peter and Carl I think and then right. it it was always just one of those things you know we we ended up writing started writing a song together like at three a.m. or something like. At, at someone's yeah. house party and then yeah because just, that, it, it, that was just a thing that happened wasn't it yeah and the, it was, exactly, that was yeah. some of the things that were just so amazing about those days that i mean people like i don't know if people understood it i don't know if the industry or, or whoever necessarily understood it at the time people thought it was just like all just like debauchery and hedonism and you know like but it was actually like yeah born out it was actually more romantic than that. It was like, yeah, it was built out of stuff like people just wanting to stay up all night writing songs and stuff. You know what I yeah, mean? Exactly, it wasn't yeah. just like it wasn't people just like going out on a on a Friday night booze up. It was nothing like that. It was like far, yeah. it, was, it was far more romance to the whole thing. So yeah, so you anyway, you were writing a song with them at three AM like everyone used to do. So and then what yeah. happened? But the, and and then I guess yeah the, we just ended up like it turned into us doing an EP and like um that's when we ended up writing that lady boy song that we did with him. Yeah. It's pretty cool. But like yeah, it's a similar similar thing in it, you know, you just It you is end up yeah. Meet, meeting everybody through somebody else. It's like I was saying, it does it's like a small world, like, you know what I mean, that um like every like, you know, Everyone who's into the same stuff kind of knows each other and moves in the same circles. So it's like you mm. all end up like meeting up at some point because, um, like, you know, um, like, yeah, we, we took it, like, we would take Adam on tour. Uh, like, you know, he came on quite a few UK tours with us. And, like, yeah. I, I, I was really like, I loved that Molly Peaches record so much. And, like, it, like, it, was, it seemed really, like it seemed really weird to like all of a sudden be like you know playing with someone who like yeah i had so much respect for like before we were um you know like i was a bit of i felt a bit like a fanboy at first you know what i mean yeah and, and, then, and really then he was supporting you yeah obviously that leads on to working with johnny Marr as well right um was that kind of the same thing where it just like kind of happened through just meeting him basically yeah but it was kind of different it was because um at this point gary was living in portland and um a lot of his friends in portland you know obviously uh like he like in portland he knows everyone within the music scene out there because yeah like everyone's just everyone knows each other and he uh he, he was just good friends with the modest mouse guys and the guys from the shins and stuff so he just happened to be at a party one night um oh no i think he said he was at a barbecue one day uh someone from modest mouse's house and he was like a, a guy with an english accent came up to him and was like oh i love the cribs like hey things is my favorite song and all this kind of stuff and I think it took a moment for the penny to drop with him that it was Johnny because he was like, at first he was like, how come there's another Northern English guy in Portland at this party? That's weird. And then, yeah, I guess he put two and two together and, and realised, because Johnny was in Modest Mouse at the time, realised who it was because, you know, everyone knows, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's not difficult to recognise him. But um, And then 
like Gary told me about that and I was it, it, he, I remember he was excited about it because he knew that like I was always a big fan of Johnny's playing when when the band first started I, I, that was some, you know it was it was really cool um for me to hear that he was a that he was just a fan of our band you know he just he just got into us organically I think he said he heard us on the radio when he was driving in his car and he, he, it just blew him away and he, you know um, so that was that was really rad. And then I'm, I met Johnny at Glastonbury because us and Modest Miles were playing the same uh, the same stage on the same day. And uh, yeah, we just got like chatting and just exchanged numbers. And then we would just text each other and keep in touch regularly. And eventually, he was like, "Oh, you know, let's just write a song together. Let's just do one song." And um, so that's what we planned to do. We booked a studio uh, up in Manchester and went over there to write one song. And by the end of the day, we had we'd written four songs. So we were like, "Oh, we should just keep this going and see what happens with it," because he was still in Modest Mouse, and yeah, we were friends with those guys. And so we didn't want to like like steal him away or anything. But um, we ended up just like going and spending so much time at his house and like writing all the time that we came out of it with an album. And um, by that point, we were all just so close that he just, yeah, he, he was like, look, you know, I just think, I, you know, I just really want to join the band. So, um, and by that point, when by the time he said that, we'd got so used to having him around that we were like, uh, oh yeah, you know, we hadn't even really thought about it. You know, we hadn't even really thought about, oh, are we going to ask him to join or what? You know, I mean, it was just something that, just naturally kind of grew. I think a lot of the times, like, you know, like the way that I look at it is like a lot of the time when people do collaborations, especially people like Johnny, you know, because he was in the Smiths and a lot of people think, oh, unless he's playing with Morrissey, they just don't want to know or they're just instantly going to hate it just because it's not the Smiths. But um, I actually felt like it was a really successful collaboration that we did together, you know. I listen to that record now, and I'm like, not that I ever really listen to our records, but if I listen to that record now, I'm just like, yeah, this is this was like, you know, I, I think it was just a really successful collaboration, you know. I think on paper, a lot of people at first were like, oh, I don't know how this is going to work out, because they're a punk rock band, and Johnny, you know, was known for, like, like he's working the Smiths, but I actually think we worked really well together. It was really intuitive, you know, we never had any conversations about, like me and him never sat down to work guitar parts out or anything. We were just, you know, it was right. just really intuitive. Yeah, you can tell that from, is it the Secret Saved documentary? Where you're just kind of like working out a song in the studio kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I yeah, I haven't watched that in a long time, so I'm not sure, but I know that me and Johnny were supposed to, like, we had plans that, oh, before the studio, we should book, like, me and him should just hang out at his house for a week and just go through all the guitar parts and make sure they all, like, interlock and, like, intertwine with each other because we're both lead players. So, like, um, you know, we wanted to figure out who was going to play what where. But we just didn't need to do it because when, like, it, it, it was just, there was no need because, yeah, the way that we would play together, just you know, you know what I mean it just seemed to just really lock in really well anyway so we didn't have to do anything boring like that like sit down and work stuff out yeah and was the plan for him to stay a bit longer than he did or was it just to see how it went kind of thing mm, I think it was more of kind of like see how it went thing I know that at the time you know there was a lot of talk about it, it was like you know going to be a permanent thing and stuff but we'd been on task so much that so we did like after we did men's needs we'd been on the you know that was that was our third record i mean it was weird because we put that album out in 2000 and uh, no we put that album out in 2007 and in 2007 that was when like guitar music was at its highest point in the mainstream in the uk at that point it was super mainstream it's like guitar music was like you know that was the commercial style of music it was what was on the radio and stuff so like we put out um men's things and it was weird because for us that was our third record and you know we we did a spoken word track on it with 
Lee Ronaldo and stuff. And so it, for us, that was like our third record. We were like a long way into our career. But to a lot of people, like, you know, like Radio One and stuff, <laughs> because it was our first web, uh, record that we'd worked with a major label on, it was almost like, like, oh, it was almost like we were, they treated us kind of like a new band in some ways, you know what I mean? Because that was the first time that they Radio One started playing us and stuff like that. So, like, around 2000, around men's news period, we had a lot of touring. There was loads to do because it was so, you know, because it was, it was so, that style of music was so popular at that point. And that's when, why we were all, you know, at the time we were always complaining about it, kind of saying that we didn't want to be associated with a lot of the other indie bands at the time, you know, and that wasn't us being like elitist or petty or anything. It's just for us, it was our third record and we don't want to be like put in the same boat as a lot of these, like, you know, a lot of those second wave indie bands that were also on, like, you know, on radio one at that same time, you know, that wasn't our scene. That's not where we came from. Like, you know, we like, like came up from somewhere like, you know, we came up through a much more, like, you know, the, the indie pop world, that's where we started. So we didn't want people to think that, you know, there was a lot of, I, I felt like there was a lot of major label acts around at the time that, you know, it was just part of like, uh, you know, because that style of music was popular, there was just like, it was, there was just so many bands around and like, yeah, for us it was our third record and, you know, we already, you know, we, like, we, it was, we, we were being treated, like, I think that, like, to a lot of people, that was like, their first exposure of us with the third album, so there's a lot of work to do anyway, and we'd already toured, you know, the first album, the second album, the third album, we were intending on taking a break at that point, because we were really, fr you know, we'd been on the road for years and we were fried, and then we met Johnny and made a record, and so, the, you know, we put that out and the plan was for us after the record with Johnny was we needed to have a break because then that would be four albums in, in a row without taking a break, you know, which is, it's, it's like, anyone will tell you touring is just not good for you uh, mentally or physically, so we needed to take a break, but um, Johnny was really keen to do another record, um, like straight after, and we were like, look, you know, we were kind of like, oh, we need to have some time off. We can't do it. We need to try and get our personal lives in, you know, sorted out. And, um, you know, we just need to have a bit of a break. So he started working on some, I guess he started working on a solo record. And me, Gary and Ross always write stuff together when we're together anyway. So I guess we'd kind of started writing some more songs too. But, like, mm -hmm. he called us and he was like, look, you know, I like, respect the fact that you guys need to have a break, but I, uh, you know, like, I, I'm, you know, I'm eager to put another record out and keep working. So we, we were just like, that's, we totally respect your decision, that's fine, you know. And, uh, yeah, we kind of ended on, you know, really amicable, good terms, you know. We, we, we knew that he wanted to make a solo record and... So we were happy for him to do that. You know, we're never going to stand in the way of people doing what they want. It's up to him. So, um, yeah, that's how it all kind of came to an end. And we weren't... It was, it was interesting because when Johnny left, yeah, that kind of... Even though we were trying to have a break at the time, it really made it so that we had to immediately go into the studio and start writing another record. Because, like, if we take too long out after this, people, you know... we because Johnny's left now and there was a lot of press about it, we kind of felt pressure to come back with a bang as quickly as possible, you know what I mean? Because mm. to a lot of bands, I guess, like, losing someone like Johnny Marr, people would think, oh, you know, that's like a huge blow to a band. So we just knew that we had to come back uh, as quickly as we could just so that, uh, you know, just to re-establish ourselves as a three-piece, because we, we were always a three-piece beforehand. Men's News had been, like, a really successful record for us. So we, um, after Johnny left, yeah, we were just like, we just need to re-establish ourselves as a three-piece. And so, again, and so it made it so we had to, yeah, 
we wanted to have time off, but we just had to just get straight back in the studio. Yeah, is that when you and Gary like went to a hotel somewhere and started writing a lot of songs? No, the, the period. No. no, I mean they didn't really. That's not really how it worked. What, oh, okay, all right. What happened was Gary lived in Portland in two thousand. So that was before men's needs. Gary lived in Portland, and Ross lived in Wakefield. His girlfriend and I, because I was on the t- the road so much. I didn't have anywhere to go when I came off the road, you know what I mean? There was no point in me, like, renting a house anywhere or anything. So I was just kind of, like, when I wasn't on the road, I was just just always kind of, like, you know, travelling around, hanging out with different people and just living, like, a transient lifestyle. And I was uh, in an indie night in Ipswich, <laughs> which... It's a very glamorous way to start so <laughs> an indie night in Ipswich. And, um, like, the guy that ran it on the hotel, it was a really, like, old-fashioned, it was really, like, uh, you know, like, really old-fashioned, like, um, hotel, like, old-school hotel. And he wanted to put, it had a big ballroom, and he wanted to put the indie night on there. And so he was going to move it there. And he was like, oh, you can just have one of the rooms. You can live in one of the rooms of the hotel. That can just be where you live. And um, uh, as long as, like, you know, you come to the indie night every, like, <laughs> weekend or something. <laughs> so I guess I was there, like, it's you know, like, it's like, come and see the, you know, come to this indie night and, you know, was it? I, I was going to be there. But And then uh, what I got out of the deal was, I got to live in one of the hotel rooms, but yeah, I said so I was just in a period where I just didn't have anywhere to live, basically. So I was staying in this hotel room, and that, that's where I, the guy was living in Portland, writing men's needs, and I would do a lot of my writing there. Um, but you know, which felt romantic at the time because that he told me that, like, I, I don't know who it was, but like, yeah, some really uh, famous, like, uh, classic. English writer had stayed there in the past and he wrote something there so it seemed kind of cool but I can't remember who it was now it was a long time ago I mean that's you know going back to 2006 I mean like it just seems you know the idea of living like that now just seems completely I I just could like if someone asked me if if I wanted to go back and do it all again I probably would, but I'd be really scared, you know what I mean? If I was like, do you want to go do all those years again? I'd be like, yeah, definitely. But I'd be, I'd be really scared, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually um, I actually meant the, you know, the album cover for Belly and the Brazen Bull. Is, is that a hotel room oh, where you and Gary wrote some songs? Right. Um, yeah, like, we, because what happened was to, for, to for Brazen Bull, uh, you know, yeah, because Johnny... It was, a, you know, after Johnny had left, um, we went, like, me and Gary used to like to get together to start writing the records in a really, like, casual way. So it wasn't like we'd all get together and be like, oh, we've got to write a record now. I would go out and visit Gary in Portland just to hang out for a couple of weeks, and then we'd just do bits and pieces of writing. And during that time, we would, like, you yeah, know, we would take road trips places, and um, do things to, you know, to try and get, you know, to get inspired and to try and um, figure out what kind of record we want to make. So, yeah, yeah, we spent, we, we, that, yeah, on Brazen Bull, yeah, that was one of the hotels that we stayed in. And, um, you know, we, we didn't really do much writing there necessarily. It was more like we would come up with, like, the concept for the record, what kind of album we wanted to make and, um, you know, we would kind of like, like tr- just figure out where our heads were at and what kind of record we wanted to make, you know, and do some. Yeah, we would we'd r- record like some rough demos and then go on these road trips and just like listen to the songs on the night and come up with like extra bits and lyrics and ideas and stuff. But it wasn't like, yeah, it wasn't like a, a planned thing. It was just that's just like we 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 just used to kind of like try and find. Uh, interesting things to do whilst we were writing so it wasn't just a case of as you know a case of the band all get together and then go in a studio and try and write some songs because that's just that's hard work you know like there's pressure on you there 
we always try and do stuff to take like to so make it so that writing the record is actually enjoyable and doesn't feel like a lot of pressure. Yeah, I was saying to Tom, we've got to ask you about your take on this Liam Gallagher story, if you listen to it that Gary told us. Um, I, I, yeah, it, it is, yeah, it's, it is true. But I mean, it's it's funny because, um, yeah, like, I remember, I, I mean, because the thing is, like, me and Gary were, we, uh, we, we were always into, um, like, in the 90s, we were always into, like, the US stuff, like, you know, we got into Nirvana, and that turned us on to, like, Sonic Youth, and then that turned us on to all the underground labels and stuff. So we were never really that, we were never into Britpop at all, you know, so we were never fans of Oasis or anyone like that. Um, but um, we'd, like, we'd done a few shows, like, with Noel, and he'd always been really cool to us. He was always really nice to us. And then uh, I was at, we were at the Enemy Awards in 2015 where uh, we got given that... Uh, we, we were getting the lifetime. No, what was it? Uh, some, I'm going to have to go and have a look at what it says on the award because I can't remember what it is now. It's something <laughs> cool, though. Um, so we were getting the outstanding contribution to music award at the Enemy Awards, and uh, afterwards we were at the at the Groucho Club or somewhere like that in London. That's where the after show was, and some like guy runs up to me and he's like. He's like, all right, mate, oh, Liam wants to have a drink with you at the bar. Will you come have a drink at the bar with Liam? And I'm like, who's Liam? Like, and he's like, Liam Gallagher, you know, as if like, I'm just going to know exactly who Liam is. <laughs> and because, like, the world is called Liam, you know what I mean? And he's like, Liam Gallagher, come have a drink at the bar. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. And so, because, you know, I was, I'm not, as I said, I wasn't a fan of voices, but I'm like, yeah, that would be cool. I can take time to life to go and have a, a drink with Liam at the bar. Yeah, that will be fun. So I went over, and it's like, it's weird. He started out being nice, but then I kind of feel like, I don't know whether or not he wanted to be a dick or if he was just trying to, you know, live up to his reputation or something, but he was like, oh, um, he was like, congratulations on the award. Yeah, you guys have had a really good career. And I was like, oh, thanks. And he's like, he's like, fucking it. He was like, what did he say now? He's like, you guys have had a really good career. And then he, he slagged my haircut off, and he sat there with the exact same haircut. And I, was just like, <laughs> I was just like, fuck you, and just turned my back on him. And I just stood, like, with my back turned to him, and, uh, like, kind of uh, completely blanking him and ignoring him from that point on. And then I ended up, like, wandering off and going, like, you know, doing something else and hanging out with my brother. And, yeah, that he's like, whoever that... that this wigger or hanger on was who you know approached me in the first place came up and said to uh said to me he's like oh you know liam was you know liam's a nice guy he's being cool you know you know he's like freaking out and he was like saying oh, i don't know what happened you know i don't know why he pissed off and all this kind of stuff and so gary hears it and he's like what's what's going on like he's like who are you pissed off with i'm like oh i'm not pissed off with anyone it's just you know like uh like liam gallagher was just being a bit of a knob or whatever so Gaz was like it, like he like started getting pissed off with this wigger guy he was like oh you know i guess he went into like some kind of protective mode and started getting all pissed off and i was like and then you know we had to like catch ourselves because he was like he was like oh man it'd be such a cliche if we end up like like at the enemy awards and end up getting in a fight with liam gallagher he's like you can't do it so like <laughs> We just left it, but he was pissed off at that. I think we were both pissed off at him at some point during that night. But I don't know what, I think he was maybe trying to be nice, but he was trying to, you know, live up to being who he is. Because, like, I once saw him on Twitter and he posted a picture of what he was listening to on Spotify and it was us guys. So, and someone else retweeted it to us. So I'm like, does he like us or does he hate us? I just don't know and I just don't care. But <laughs> that's the way it is. Um, you had a few run-ins with him, didn't you, Tom? Yeah, yeah I, remember the, I remember reading the... Cool, I was looking at the enemy cool list. Do you remember that, Tom? Yeah. What a big deal <laughs> the enemy cool list used to be back yeah. in the day. But I was looking at that... What, and, it was, 
and they, they said to me like who's the least cool person in rock and roll and you said liam gallagher so i figured there must be something going on with you guys <laughs> yeah i remember that it was just, yeah i mean it was all it's just a bit of banter joking though isn't it you know I mean? but like yeah. he would he would always start it though. like he started that just for no reason just started slagging us off and it was just like it was his vibe though and it was it was just the way that he I think he got in the probably, press or whatever. I think it's probably because they were so, you know, like when they started, they were so popular for being like, you know, like young and fresh and exciting. And so maybe when like, yeah, there's other bands coming out that make them feel like, you know, like, you know, maybe, you know, it maybe feels like other bands are getting popular. It maybe just feels like, threatening or something yeah I think, I think, definitely I, I think he just felt a little bit irrelevant at the time or whatever yeah he needed yeah, he at needed that to, period yeah the point yeah for sure yeah he was just like right i mean you know it just it was like in the sun or something like that and he just uh he just said that we were shit or something and it was just like Cheers for that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really lame thing to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. I never understood that, like, slagging off other bands personally by the name. It's like, I just mm. think that that's, like, I, I just, I don't know. It's just never been my style. It just seems like a really, it just seems like a really lame thing to do because, like, yeah, it's like, you know, he might say that as a throwaway quote, but yeah, you have to read it about it in the sun and it's just like, oh yeah, nice. Yeah. Cheers, you know what I mean? And that's cool. Yeah, I suppose <clears> that's what made like that naughty scene uh, a bit unique compared to like the 90s because like you say like you guys still playing small venues and stuff you never get a band like Oasis doing that they're just like they'd leave all that yeah. behind them kind of thing exactly yeah it was all about that whole thing of just wanting to be uh, like mega bands and stuff and like there was stuff like that in the noughties I remember you get a lot of bands saying oh we just want to be the biggest band in the world and all this kind of stuff and like I think they were encouraged to be that way but that that was like the stuff that came later. That was all like the you know, that was all stuff past two thousand and six, two thousand and seven. I think that the yeah. early era stuff. It was like yeah, it was a very communal feel to it, and like all the bands sounded different. As I was saying, there'd be like stuff like like electro clash bands playing with guard rock bands, and like the only thing that that uh, united all these people was just the fact that you know there was they were all young and enthusiastic and you know just everyone was having a good time together you know so it was, it was very like in the early days I, I did see it as being like a really communal thing like everyone knew each other and everyone helped each other out and uh everyone was doing it for you know for the right reasons which was just the you know the experience and the and the fun of it you know and then um, looking at uh, things for guitar bands now ryan like obviously that like, the impact of the internet and we were asking like, alan mcgee about his thoughts on spotify and stuff and um and that there's this new kind of appeal for uh to get artists more money through spotify i think tom from gomez is leading it um, right. like, what's your opinion on streaming and stuff and new well, bands kind of getting a foot, foot on the ladder yeah i'm not entirely like <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're, we're having to become a lot more aware of that stuff now. Yeah, because when we first started, like <laughs> the paradigm was still totally different. It was like everything was geared around selling uh, physical records and stuff. Which, I, you know, at that point, you know, it's easier to it's easier to figure out like how many records people sold. And so Spotify is done by like you know you just get a tiny. I think it's like you just get a tiny split of it just spread over many years, you know what I mean, as people continue listening to your record because it's there forever. So in some ways I think it's like good that, like, yeah, it means that, like, because if, if you just released a CD, uh, you know, if I wanted to listen to a CD by some of the bands I was into when I was a kid, chances are it's probably in a, in a box in my mum's attic or something and I can't find it but it's on Spotify so you can listen to it again on there so it's, it's good in that way is that like it's good for getting out there but as far as sustaining the career it's kind of like like for new for new apps especially like you're really hoping that you're just gonna you know that you really it, it, you're really hoping that you're gonna put something out and it's gonna get really big um you know, organically or virally or whatever, you know what I mean? Because, the you know, the labels 
I don't know what it's like anymore, but it tended to be like the labels were just signing stuff that was already getting big on the internet. You know what I mean? It wasn't like back in the day where labels would sign a band and help grow them. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, right. like, like labels are just signing stuff that's already doing well on its own. But if you're already doing well on your own, why would you then need the label anyway? You know? So it kind of feels mm -hmm. like there's like a. I don't know, it, that, that kind of part of it just doesn't really make sense to me. I mean, uh, and like, because, like, yeah, we predate, like, you know, we, we, like, when we first started going, the internet wasn't that prevalent in the music industry. I mean, the first time I became aware of it was, you know, the new fellas got leaked. So our second record got leaked something like three months before it came out. And it was like, that, that that was when I became aware of the internet and music because it, yeah that was just like like a real like that really sucked because that meant that we had to instead of waiting to go out and tour the new fellas we just had to just immediately get out there and start promoting it because it, got, it leaked and it was everywhere but um, yeah the uh, like because yeah anyway because like like yeah we come from that time where the internet was so early it's like i wouldn't re i wouldn't really know how to like start and operate now like if i wasn't already in the cribs because it's like we already are established and we already have our fan base and stuff you know what i mean so that's all that i know so to start again now i i'm not entirely sure how I would how i would go about it because i'm just still used to that old school way of doing stuff you know that's how i did it back in the day and yeah i, I can't even really i can't even really picture how i would do it now because i'm not in that situation you know yeah and i mean a few a thing that a few guests have said including gary is that maybe people aren't that keen for guitar bands at the minute is that something you're aware of or what do you think um oh i mean i think that like there'll always be that thing where um like yeah so you had like yeah in the 90s and stuff you had grunge and brick pop and all that kind of stuff and then people like if you remember the late 90s was all about dance music and the new acoustic movement and all that stuff and then in, you get into the 2000s and it goes back to guitar music but it's the reason it's changed now is because there used to be a big division between like pop acts and uh you know like indie or rock acts you know what i mean there used to be a big divide between them, but now pop acts kind of want to have the credibility of indie acts and indie acts kind of want to cross over into the pop world you know like people that are like kids that are like that have grown up with um streaming and stuff it's like they're not necessarily into just one style of music like what we used to be you know for me growing up musical music was like a tribal kind of thing it's like you were you know you got into what you were into you became a mosher or whatever and that was what you were and you were like passionate about that and you you know you, you were kind of like not into other stuff you know but um mm -hmm. now that people have grown up with like streaming yeah it's almost like everyone's into a little bit of everything so it's like it, i don't even really know necessarily know what guitar music it is anymore because like yeah the standard like guitar bass drums vocal thing might seem like a bit outmoded now because everyone is recording stuff on laptops and stuff so they think oh the idea of having like electronic elements it isn't a uh, an alien thing whatsoever because they probably listen to so many different styles of music so the idea of like one of a generation just coming about that is just like massively only into guitar music and that's it you know that seems like a bit of an old-fashioned idea really yeah, yeah but it'll never go away i mean people still you know it's like you'll still like even if stuff isn't mainstream, that doesn't matter. I mean, the mainstream has always sucked, you know. That, that's just something that everyone knows. It's like, the mainstream has always sucked, in my opinion. And, like, um, so th there'll always be, like, people who, like, are into, like, any kind of music you can think of, they'll always, like, you know, the, everyone's so connected now that, that, like, you'll always be able to find, uh, you know, people who are into it. They, whether or not it'll ever get like whether or not it'll get massive again i i just can't say i mean probably like anything can happen can't it? i mean i just, just couldn't predict it so. no exactly yeah
And I guess it's like, I don't know, kind of looking for it as well. Um, I mean, back in the day, like for someone like me, uh, finding new bands, I'd be listening to Zane Lowe every night. And I know that was I'm a bit younger than you guys. That's probably yeah. not a cool thing to say, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> but now I suppose like shows like Mark Riley are quite good for like finding new bands and stuff like that. So I guess it's yeah looking for it as well, I suppose, isn't it? It is, yeah, but that's what that's the thing. I don't know whether or not, like, like now, there's not stuff like set aside, like, oh, this is the, you know, like Zane Lowe used to be like, yeah, the the rock DJ or whatever, and now things aren't necessarily like that. It's like I feel like the DJs like play like a. There's just a lot of cross pollination going on in music at the minute, you know. Yeah. Um, there isn't those divides um, drawn up like what there used to be in the past, and you know for all that you know that i don't know like division obviously is usually not a good thing but but i think that that is something that used to make music exciting was when you decided what style of music you were into and you know you, yeah yeah you, you 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 lived and died by that you know what i mean and you yeah, would have rivalries and stuff i mean i thought yeah. that was made stuff exciting i feel like now there's not like any real like obsession do you know what i mean yeah. Like, no, you know, yeah, the yeah, people I, like I was obsessed with bands anymore. Do you remember it was like, you know, like just so many bands in the 90s and even the 90s. Yeah. It was just like, there was a real focus on on just like that one thing where, like you say, now there's just so much going on and like crossing over and stuff. Like, yeah, there's a lot happening. And also, like, um, again, a lot of it goes down to the fact that, like, um, a lot of people like you know like to promote themselves a lot of people overshare things that are happening in their lives and like you know you look at how things used to be back in the day and the, the only thing that people knew about a band was what they were you know what the press was saying or like what yeah you know, like their videos or their records and stuff so people had to fill in the blanks in their head yeah you know, it, 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 it automatically make them you know that, that's how they would get obsessed with them by wondering what it was yeah, like inside so, their day life so true yeah and it, it's like mm. the, the the most exciting thing about loving a band is not really knowing like yeah the fact that it's kind of on, what's going on in there but yeah 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 exactly yeah yeah, definitely. I remember that being the reason why I really got into the White Stripes because there's so much mystery about them, and you don't really get yeah. that kind of mystery about bands these days, do you? No, and uh, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, uh, the yeah, the fact that like I guess when they came out, there was like a lot of talk about the Detroit scene and stuff like that, and you think, oh no, it's like there. That sounds like sounds really exciting and stuff, you know. And like, um, but now you can just see it. Yeah, everything's worldwide now. Yeah, you know, there isn't necessarily. I mean, I'm sure there is somebody, still like regional things, but it yeah. Doesn't... But as soon as somebody does something now, as well, like it's straight on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, anyway. So yeah, and so like, and people, I guess it like stuff like that because it's happening all the time and so quickly it erodes people's uh, like you know attention span as well. You know what I mean? It's like mm. it's always something new. Like you know, like we, you know, you go on on Twitter or whatever, and there'll be like a bunch of new stories per day. You know, so it's like even if something yeah. a band did something really interesting, it's just one of a bunch of stories that you can read yeah. that day. Not not yeah, that it's quite, week, that day. So it's quite disposable, isn't it? Bands are more. Yeah, just it, yeah. People just have the same disposable. attention span as a result. But I, I still try and be like. Um, I still try and like be optimistic and, and stuff about things because I think that ultimately, like if you write like good music, like people still like you know as long as you write good songs and like people and you care about it, like it will always it will always find its place somewhere. It just will. Mm. You know, people, people always want it. look back at that period ryan like is there anything you would do differently um well I, I i was thinking about it and i was like i was thinking about it the other day and i'm like i don't think i would do anything differently i don't like you know there's nothing that i look back on and i'm like oh that was you know uh you know that sucked but the, but at the same time it's like um 
I kind of feel like it, yeah, it was such an exciting time and there was so much positivity going on. Yet I feel like a lot of the time, like we were either stressed out or focusing on the negatives or just getting like just getting hammered somewhere. You know what I mean? And it's like I just, I, I, it's almost like I, I look back on it and it's difficult to like. It's difficult to figure out if I enjoyed it or not because there was just so much, you know. It's almost like I, it's difficult to take stock of. I can't look back on it because I mean, because I'm still doing it. You know, I'm still on the road, and obviously stuff has changed a lot since then. But it's like, it, you know, it's almost like for for me, it's um, and you know, thankfully, as I was saying, you know, like on the last record, we've we've been doing our biggest shows and stuff. So to me, it's almost like. I just see it as being like a, a period of the band and it's, it's like I can't, it's almost like I, I, I'm not looking back on it yet. But, um, and if I did it differently, it would change where I'm at now. You know what I mean? Because I'm still doing, you know, we're, we're, the Cribs are still like, like still around, we're still doing our thing. So I wouldn't want to risk changing something because it might all be completely mm. different. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, yeah well, it, and it was fun it was just really really fun if um so like with your next album whether you, you know i don't know where you're at with anything but yeah like, what's your aim for like do you have like a plan in your head for what is uh, what you want the next album to be like well the the main thing like when like when we make a record is i, I think that um like yeah, we don't we don't necessarily like you know we don't we don't ever contrive like what we're gonna like come up with and what we're gonna do. But it's like the last record yeah we did like this that record with Steve Albini it was so raw. I was, was gonna so, say like, it, kind of, it kind of went back to basics a bit. We did you, yeah, that. but I mean yeah. that that was so raw that it's like I kind of and it wasn't even really meant to be a record. It meant to be an EP at first and putting that out really uh, yeah. But we, we ended. up because we worked so quick at Albini's, we, you know, we did like a full album and like that, I feel like, like the main thing is, it's like that was supposed to just be like a bonus release or like a stop gap thing before we put our next record out. And, you know, the plans for the next record was to, um, you know, kind of be, try and be a little bit more like we were on the first album, really, like, you know, like poppy and kind of like, you know, not, and, and and still strips back and record stuff live, but not in the way that we did at Steve Albini's. So we just, like, you know, we just kind of want to go back to what made, the, the things that made us excited in the first place, you know what I mean? And just, um, I think that that's kind of the idea for the next record. And I saw, I think it was the Belly in the Brazen Bull album where you produced a few songs yourself in Abbey Road. Um, yeah. How was that experience? Is that something you want to do again at some point? It, yeah, it was fine. I mean, to be honest, when we make our records, we're, you know, we produce most of the stuff with the producer or ourselves anyway, because we, uh, you know, the songs are all, always completely 100% finished and arranged and, um, you know, we get really involved with the recording and production anyway, because we always used to have our own studio. So it it wasn't it wasn't weird going in Abbey Road and producing stuff. It just felt like it was just how we normally go about doing stuff anyway. So yeah, I, I think that we probably will be uh, producing more of our own stuff in the future. Just because I mean, yeah, we we always have done even. Like, yeah, we did that record with, like, Rick Akasek and stuff, and it was great having him around, and he did really add to the vibe and stuff like that. Mm. But, you know, this, as far as the songs went, um, everything was totally finished, and as far as, like, uh, like sonically went as well, you know, we were, we were still really involved in that side of it too with Rick, so... OK, and we've got a couple of fun questions, if that's all right to finish on, Ryan. One from Adam Wilson 929 who says, How did Alex Kapanos end up with the name Airwolf during recording the third album? And was that studio in Vancouver really haunted? Um, I don't know, I don't know if it was really haunted, it was creepy. I mean it was run by it was owned by Brian Adams and apparently the uh there'd been I think it was like there was a big fire in Vancouver and they'd had to stack bodies in there, like um like back in the, you know, like 
back like years and years ago. It, and it did have a creepy vibe about that studio, but it was just because it was a big old building, you know. But um, like you know, we always like I think everyone just felt a little bit creeped out in it. But um, it was a cool place. But Alex got the name Airwolf because. I don't fully remember this story, but he was telling us a story about some some like one of like someone that he went to a party with who was on acid or something, and it, it, there were there were like some of his friends were talking about the TV show Airwolf, you know, like that eighties TV show, right? And this guy who was on acid could hear them talking about this tv show called airwolf and he was convinced they were talking about him and he said am i airwolf and when alex told us that story we just thought it was really funny and so we started calling him airwolf right. yeah it looks like you had a i mean what i was watching those what they called eye casts like the making yeah. of the album it looked like you had a really good laughter in that in vancouver no yeah it, it was we had a really good time it, it sucks as well because um all those, all the video of that stuff, like, you know, we filmed everything. We sent it to that company to make those little documentaries. Oh, uh, right. And they never sent us any of the footage back. So those little documents on YouTube are literally the only things we have left of it. Ah, uh, right. Oh, yeah. Then we've got another one from Paul underscore Big Liz who asks, how many times did Shippo put the wrong fuel in the van? He only did it <laughs> once, but... Um, <laughs> Like once is enough because when you're on tour, you know, you know, it's like it's like late at night and it's freezing cold and you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got to get yeah. to the hotel and then get to another gig the next day. When you someone fills the van up with uh, petrol and it's a diesel van and all of a sudden you've got to get someone out, it's like 3 a.m. or whatever it was, 4 a.m. and someone's uh, a guy's got to come out and then pick your van up and then. Uh, tow it to you know we were right in the middle of nowhere tow it to like a local garage sit around and wait <laughs> for the local garage to open up and then they uh drain the engine and you're just sat around in in you know in their like freezing little office like a, a, in a garage and you're just all dressed like rock stars or whatever. <laughs> it's a really 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 long uncomfortable night but yeah like once was more than enough yeah i was watching the clip of it again this week and you're just like i think shipper's a bit gutted and you're just like oh someone get some chuddy for shipper yeah that, that was like the joke we're like are oh, you gonna have to like you're gonna have to uh siphon the engine off because we didn't like we honestly didn't know what to do because that gas uh -huh. that petrol station was just on a country road you know what i mean there was nothing around so we were like um like it was yeah it was just it it was a real it, it, it that it was just it, you know you think that, like being in a band it looks so glamorous but like you know that night was like the absolute antithesis of a glamorous night you know <laughs> it was horrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah you had a you had the same van gary was saying didn't you song you had a few long trips yeah. in the van yeah, yeah it does it does literally point. exactly the, the the riot van I think I think we I don't think anyone I don't think Ali ever filled up the um, tank wrong, but we've definitely broken down a few times and just like Did sat you? on the motor. Yeah, we, I, I, I can't remember. If, uh, like you know, we just sat, you know, like you say, just sat on the we just sat on the side of the road for like fucking hours, just like yeah, oh my God. yeah. It's just yeah, it's horrible. I mean, but I'm surprised that that happened because like we got that that yeah that, that police van and like. Um, you know, all the tyres on it, because it's a, a, like owned by the cops, are like, they're like they've got steel rims inside, you know, so they can mm. drive over like those, you know, the, so the tyres don't get burst. So the, it was great with that band. Like, we never burst a tyre. We only ever broke down once. It was like on the first gig we ever did with it. And then the rest of the time, you know, we like tarred out of it for years and it never broke down. It was like, ours was really, yeah. it was like built like a tank, you know. But Ross was yeah. always like, like working on it to make it, you know, to keep it running and stuff. But yeah, breaking down, like, yeah, it's just awful, you know. One more, Ryan, if you don't mind, just to finish on. Yeah. Uh, was there a high point of that early period? Um, there was a lot of high points on in that early period, but um, 
I I think like one of the the weirdest points was we were so used to um like yeah we would we were on you know we were touring the UK all the time we were so used to like doing like like yeah, the other small venues that, that were just out of control and stuff and then um we you know we got get, uh, we got booked to go play in Japan and we were on stage at like because the festivals are so early that like, like 10 a.m. Like, oh, there's obviously not going to be anyone here and no one will have heard of us. And they did this, we were w looking at the stage at 10 a.m. We'd been out the night before and we were like really like feeling awful. And there was these uh, video screens at the side of the stage that were counting down like 10, 9, 8, 7. And then when it got to, and we're in this massive, massive arena. And when it got to um, 1, all of a sudden our logo appeared on the screen like in like a, a like with a bolt of lightning like crackling around it and the crowd were going absolutely insane and we were like this is mental you know because we just weren't <laughs> used to it well. we're in japan we were so far away from home and yeah <clears throat> everyone knew like all the songs all the words you know and that that was that i think that was really uh, that was like a real high point too, just so unexpected, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I saw you talking about um, Martel getting to number three in Malaysia or something. Apparently, yeah. Like, um, apparently, I always did really well down there. Um, I remember us being told that, like, uh, that, like, oh yeah, Martel's in the charts at number three in Malaysia, and it's beat and it beat Coldplay. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And just didn't think anything of it because the two of the idea of like that happening was cool, but it was an abstraction. It was like it didn't seem very likely that we we're going to go down and tour there. But we got a couple of offers to go down and do tours down there, like in the late years, kind of in the brazen bull years. <clears throat> and there were for stadium shows, so I assume that yeah, we must have done pretty well down there. But then, unfortunately, there were some uh, travel bans on. Uh, Malaysia at the time, so we couldn't go down and do them. But uh, yeah, I, I assume that I'd, I don't know if I'll ever see it or ever know about it, but maybe we're just absolutely massive in Malaysia. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's like that section for Sugarman documentary where just like yeah, exactly. the biggest thing going in Malaysia. They'll bring us over at some point. You know, <laughs> like, we thought you were dead, man. And like, no. Nope. <laughs> section for Sugarman. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>